Hello, um, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us um, this afternoon for this event from Swedish Book Review. Um, my name is Alex Fleming. Um, I'm editor of SBR. Uh, and yeah, we're really grateful to um, be joined by Hannah Johansson and Wynne Tran and Kira Josefsson um, to explore these two uh, award-winning emerging voices in uh, Sw Swedish and Finland Swedish literature uh, and their works in particular, Antiken or Antiquity and uh, Skuka or Svalka, uh, Shade and Breeze. Um, both of these novels are very uh, charged and evocative and incredibly layered um, novels and it's a real treat to get to kind of explore them in depth with the authors themselves and especially because uh, Kira who has translated both of these authors has agreed to join us um, and chair this conversation. Uh, whether you are familiar with these works or um, completely new to, to Swedish literature, there will be something for you in this conversation. Um, it is being recorded um, and streamed on social media, uh, but as this is a webinar, only the panelists uh, can be seen or heard. However, if you do want to kind of communicate with each other and, and with the panel, uh, please feel free to use the chat function and also the Q&A. If you have any questions, just pop them in the chat and um, We'll get to as many as we can uh, at the end of this talk, which will be in around an hour's time. Um, that's it for me. Uh, so I'm just going to hand over to our chair, Kira Josefsson, who is a writer, editor and translator working between English and Swedish. Uh, the winner of a pen, Hein Brandt. Her work can be read in places like Granta, Svenska Dagbladet, The Nation, Göteborg's Posten, um, and Triple Canopy. Book, le book length translations and collaborations include uh, Johanna Herbmann's The Trio and Hannah Johansson's Antiquity, as well as editing Thea Backstrom's translation of Orke Hudal's uh, The Marathon Poet. Based in Queens, New York, uh, she, serves as, she serves on the editorial board of Eglenta, a Swedish journal of uh, art and politics. So thank you very much uh, for joining us and now I'll just hand over to Kira. Um, thanks so much, Alex, and, and thanks everyone um, who's who's joining us from, from near and far. Um, it's super exciting to be here um, with Min and Hannah, um, whose debuts are, are two of my favorite books from, from the last couple of years, um, both in Swedish and across languages, I would say. Um, I feel really lucky to be here uh, that we'll get to hear them uh, talk. Um, I'm also, uh, feel, I also feel really, really lucky to be um, translating them. Um, so I uh, just thought that we would uh, start uh, by introducing our two authors um, and then um, we'll have both of them read an excerpt uh, from the in uh, progress uh, English translations and then we'll have uh, a bit of discussion and as Alex said um, we'll also have time for, for audience questions or, or thoughts as well. Um, I like to say that I think these panels are the best when they're kind of like a, a, a dinner conversation or like a dinner party as opposed to like this very kind of strict thing um, as far as Zoom allows. Um, so Hanna Johansson is a writer and critic um, who frequently contributes to national Swedish uh, media on topics like art, literature, queer issues. Um, her debut is the prize winning Antiquity, which is um, I've been just, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been describing it as a, as a sumptuous gaze on desire um, between women um, and the full spectrum of attraction that exists between the, the strictures of heteronormativity. Um, sounds heady, but um, it's it's a very, very rich uh, text which uh, centers on a, on, a, on a lonely woman in her early um, 30s um, whose feelings for a glamorous older artist um, are transferred to her 15 year old daughter um, when she joins them on holiday um, in the Greek city of Ermopoli. Um, it's forthcoming in English from Catapult in 2024. Um, 
And uh, next we have Wen Tran, who grew up in Jakobstad in Finnish Ostrobothnia. Um, and he now resides in Malmö, where he uh, worked as a psychologist up until a week or so ago. Um, and now he's writing full time, um, which is very exciting for us all. Um, he's a graduate of the prestigious uh, Biskops Arna Writing School um, and his debut, Shade and Breeze, also uh, richly awarded. Um, is, I've been trying to figure out how to <laughs> how to describe this book in a, in a kind of succinct way, but um, it's a it's a collection of vignettes that um, centers on a small family in Jakobstad in small town, Finland. Um, it's uh, Ma uh, and the big brother, Hugh, and the youngest uh, preteen son, who's the unnamed narrator. Um, and uh, we kind of get into the story um, with uh, Ma getting a job at a laundromat, which is a, a job that she kind of desperately needs um, and also does her best to be proud of um, because both she and the youngest son um, are, are quite ambitious. Um, and so throughout the book, we see, um, we see Ma attempting to become a photographer. Um, she starts a blueberry picking business with other members of the town's Vietnamese community. Um, and the narrator um, on his end, um, gives up soccer in order to, to study really hard. Um, he finds himself, at least from his own point of view, to be um, a really brilliant, uh, smarter and better writer uh, student than anyone else um, in his class. Um, and then there's Hugh, um, the older brother, um, who's uh, kind of full of unruly teenage desires that uh, sort of lack of focus. Maybe he's the id of the, of the book, um, but much more than, than plot, he's, you know, disperse plot points. Um, it's it's kind of a, a, a book about um, moods and, and shades and and uh, I, I would say like dreams for life really um, is, is how I uh, would describe it. Um, it's it's forthcoming um, from Lolly Editions um, next year. So two things to, to look very much forward to. Um, and so, uh, like I said, um, we thought that we would start with a little bit of an excerpt from the In Progress uh, translations, um, starting with uh, Wynn, if you want to take it away. Thank you, Kira. Um, as you said, my, my novel consists of very many short chapters or vignettes, and, and they are all named. So I'm going to read a chapter named Red Eyes. Ma and I each had a corner of the couch. Hugh was in the bedroom. Ma was watching TV. Three stacks of photographs on the table. Most of them rejects, all black or depicting some kind of round, ambiguous light, a lamp or a moon. Some of them showed the rooms of our apartment, kitchen, living room, Ma's bedroom, mine and Hugh's bedroom, bathroom. Some were blurry close-ups, the phone, the kitchen faucet, the desk. The pictures of Hugh and me never had our eyes in them, just our backs, cheekbones, scalps. A close-up of the schoolyard swings, flower bouquets and white button-downs. These were from the end of semester ceremony. I kept looking. Photos taken inside the gymnasium from the ceremony a girl entering the stage along with her classmates. That same girl, blurry, in motion, on her way to exit the stage. In the final picture, she's about to sit back down in the audience. She, she looks into the camera. I lingered a good while over that photograph. Half-lit, suits, dresses, the indistinct movements of little kids. The girl is looking into the camera, her arms are hanging by her side. She's at ease. In the background, you can see Hugh and his silly smile, motionless in the bustle behind the girl and her red eyes. Ma looked up from her corner of the couch. That's Isabella. She was looking so pretty. This was the first evening with the photographs. Hugh came out and sat on the couch. He started flipping through one of the stacks we were both doing it. I was observing him as he sat there next to me, looking at the photographs, systematically going through them one by one. He was dedicating an equal amount of time to each of them. 
It wasn't until later when we were going to sleep that I realized he'd brought one of them into the bedroom. He was looking at it when Ma came in, when she opened the door and walked straight to his bed, where he lay belly down, half covered by the sheets, propped up on his elbows with the chin resting in his hands, the photo placed on the pillow in front of him. She entered without a word. She took the picture. She left without a word. In the muted light of his bedside lamp, I'd been able to glimpse it, the final picture of Isabella with Hugh smiling in the background, the only one that showed both of them. I would go through those photos many times until they were all mixed up. Then I would guess at the chronology, the dates, the hours, and organize them accordingly. Next, I tried other principles, color, light, focus. Finally, I organized them in accordance with the shape of the girl's eyes, starting with the largest eyes, ending with the smallest eyes. I had no time for the other pictures. To understand the order of the photographs, I'd have had to understand what preceded them. I'd have had to, to know something about Hugh's interior life, what, uh, what occupied him during those months, which is to say a burning love, blossoming red, spilling over the edges. Thanks so much, that's amazing. Um... Wish we could all applaud. <laughs> um, Hannah, do you want to do you want to go next? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Win. And uh, I feel uh, I feel really lucky that you're translating um, our our novels. Yeah. Um, on the roof, I asked if I could take her picture. You're so beautiful. The sun gilded the pale hairs on her back. They looked like someone had combed them into a curl. They were so delicate against her tanned back, like threads of silk. Her earphones leaked a bit. The music sounded like breathing. When she rolled onto her back, the wires climbed over her breasts like white nerves. She said no. She didn't like being photographed. When she closed her eyes, I almost did it anyway. Maybe she could sense me, my shadow over her body, but she didn't open her eyes. She would, she would have let me. I wanted to preserve everything, the shoulders, the sun warm skin. I wanted to fix her face in time. When she closed her eyes, I observed her uninterrupted, hungrily, her shallow belly button, the skin that was darker over her eyes and between her legs, the bikini, the mound over her crotch. I didn't take a photo. I didn't want to ruin the memory. I lay down, I stretched out. I closed my eyes against the light. Through my eyelids, I could sense her movement, her mass next to mine, her shadow, the darkness, then the sharp light, my veins like tiny bright brooks, heart beating against the ground. We lay like that for a long time, side by side in the afternoon sun. I put out my arm for her to rest her head on. Her iris labored under the eyelids, back and forth like she was dreaming. The corners of her mouth, like where the stalk had been plucked on a peach. I rubbed her back, long scratches, my arm around her like a claw, my leg between hers. She said harder, then slower, more. She smiled and the corners of her mouth clicked. Her pleasure was so pure. I used to love this when I was small, she said. Mom would always scratch my back when I couldn't fall asleep. I pictured her, a girl, belly down, back tanned, white panties, nail marks on the flesh. I stopped, aghast. She opened her eyes, don't stop. I continued, slow, harder. She closed her eyes again, her eyelids a little glossy from grease or sweat, her lips faintly separated. She shivered, her, th uh, her thighs tensed, bumpy like after the swim, even though she was warm. You're so beautiful. 
Did I tell you that? Really special. On the roof, we were close to heaven and close to the precipice, far from the world, but near ourselves, in our own time, our own room. So much, Hama. Um, it's really exciting to hear you both um, read from 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 these, uh, you know, collaborative works of ours. In in a sense, um, thank you so much for for reading um, that. That passage um, is, uh, as, as I'm sure the audience understood, perhaps um, uh, it's a scene between the younger daughter um, and the narrator. Um, and uh, things are kind of thickening um, between them, getting more uh, complicated and, and troubling, perhaps. Um, so thank you so much both for, for, for reading. Um, as, as the audience can tell, um, these novels are in many ways very different from each other in terms of, of tone um, and, and style, I think, um, but there's also a lot of overlapping um, themes. And I think uh, that there is kind of a, an overlapping kind of humor that both of you have um, that is maybe a little bit less on the surface in antiquity, Hannah, but I think there's like this like kinship between you two um, as artists uh, in, in that sense. Um, but I wanted to, to start uh, by talking about the way that um, both of your novels are, are highly um, visual, um, both in the sense that um, I think that you're both uh, truly masters at, at painting a scene. Um, there are these like gorgeous, gorgeous descriptions of, of the, of the, um, the milieus and the environments and the, the kind of emotional landscape uh, that the characters are in, in both of your books. Um, but then there's also the role that photography um, in particular as a visual form um, plays in the construction of, of narrative. Um, we saw in the excerpt that uh, Winred, uh, Ma's interest and uh, perhaps uh, at least initially um, lacking skills um, in photography um, is, a, is a recurring theme um, in Shade and Breeze um, and in in uh, antiquity, um, images and photography is very explicitly linked to the narrative, um, both in, in kind of reference to visual artworks uh, and also in the, the narrator's um, interaction uh, with her surroundings, as we saw in the excerpt that Hannah just read. Um, so curious for both of you, um, for each of you, um, how, how this obvious interest in the visual um, connects uh, to, to your work with words as authors, as writers. Um, if either of you want to jump in to start. Um, I can start maybe. I think, uh, I, I think both our novels are, are um, like really gazy, I guess. They're, uh, both the narrators are um, always looking at um, the, the other two um, characters, basically. That's, uh, I feel like there are a lot of scenes that are constructed almost like looking through a keyhole or, or through the, um, or through a camera, actually. They're, they're, um, they have um, kind of photographer personalities, even though they um, don't take um, pictures themselves. Um, but for me, this, this also comes from uh, the fact that I have a background as um, an art critic. I've been writing, um, about art for a long time and always sort of, I begin by, by um, describing things. So I think that's how it connects to the writing um, that there's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in painting, painting a picture um, in general, maybe. But we also, the first time we met, we uh, immediately started talking about um, movies. So I think maybe that's, <laughs> Uh, that's there's something there as well. I, I personally, I, I always, um, whenever I start writing something, I always wish that I was um, making a movie. So <laughs> there's there's that, I guess. Yeah, it's something. It's something very visual about both our books, and and I would say that it's it's on both uh, an explicit level like references to, to artwork and to photography uh, and so on. But, but also this thing you, you say about the, the gaze. Um, mm. And in, in my book, it, maybe it started with, the, with that because uh, when I first started writing it, it wasn't, it wasn't my intention that it would be about explicitly photography. Uh, I just 
wrote a lot of scenes and one of the scenes were when Ma had gotten herself a camera and um, first I left it un uncommented and it's not unusual in my book. I There's a lot of things that appear and then disappear without being commented so that wouldn't be weird but this camera thing I, I, I had to I had to explore, um, uh, I felt, and then, then it became a thing. But um, in, in hindsight, it feels pretty natural because I, I think this is my, my style of writing. Uh, I've always heard that I, I write in pictures and visually and so on. And first, at first I didn't really understand what that meant, but I think I do now. Um, uh, so, yeah, it became a thing, <laughs> this photography thing. And um, I think that uh, I've tried to, to explore uh, photography and uh, its relation to, to images in general. And by images, I mean inner vision or fantasies or ideas, uh, but also uh, photography's uh, relation to, to other mediums like movies. And um, yeah, I also, as you said, Han, I, I often think about when I write the scenes, I often think about how it would look like as a movie, mm. uh, how close you are to the object and when you cut the scene and when you um, uh, change perspectives mm. and so on. Uh, so I think I think we have that thing in common, and I think also that's why when we first met, that it felt so <laughs> it felt so so natural to talk about not just literature but also about movies because I think we we we, we care a lot about the the relation between those things. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, are there any any particular kind of visual um, sources or, or, or kind of, um, you know, either movies, photographs, like work of photography that that you feel um, have been particularly generative for, for these two uh, respective books? Um, it, you know, are there any kind of like starting points for you or is it more of a, a general um, theme in, in your writing, but as it relates to these uh, novels specifically? Um, there was the, the the first time we met, we uh, we spoke a lot about um, the movie Happy Together by Von Kervai, which um, yeah, it's it's a really incredible <laughs> movie for anyone who hasn't seen it. And um, it's uh, I I wouldn't say that um, that this particular novel was was informed by that really, but um, I actually I sometimes think that I I got a method from from that movie because the premise of it is. Or very simplified. Uh, two lovers are uh, searching for a waterfall that they saw on a lamp um, and never end up there, really. Um, and I think I think that's um, a really lovely metaphor for writing. <laughs> that you're sort of you see something, you pick something up, uh, and that you dream of, and you want to go there and then um, end up um, somewhere else. So. Um, in that sense, I, I feel like it's very generative. But um, with antiquity, there there is a scene um, or a reflection where the narrator um, thinks back on on the movie If by Lindsay Anderson um, and realizes that her her recollection of the movie is uh, is wrong. Um, she remembers um, a certain scene in the movie. Um, I think she has she has a friend or her her friend's boyfriend has a who is sort of a cinephile uh, as well um, has a different view on, on on what happens in that scene. So I was I was interested in using um, movies or or it, that sort of images to to um, explore memory basically um, when writing antiquity. What do you say, Wing? I just want to talk about more talk more about happy together. <laughs> Uh, yeah, let's let's do that. But uh, a couple months after we met uh, in Malmo, uh, I I went to the cinema alone for the first time in my life because in in uh, Malmo there had they had uh, a couple of weeks with the Wonkarwai theme, 
And uh, the first movie I went to alone was Happy Together. And after I saw it, I heard from a person that went to in the same class as you, Hanna, at Valland. And he said that the same day that I went to the cinema, you had had some kind of lecture on yeah. on this same movie, on Happy Together. And I, I'm I'm not sure what, what it was about, something about time or something like mm. that. But it uh, um, it was uh, it, it's it was a funny thing. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, um, I I wouldn't say that that movie in particular is is uh, uh, an, a very big inspiration for my novel. Um, although that waterfall you talked about, uh, they find on a lamp. Yeah. It's also in in my book, but it's found on a, a cup. So okay. that's the only <laughs> the the only reference to that movie. But um, actually, I had when I first started to write the book, I I thought really much about uh, uh, a Thai Thai movie by mm. Api Chatpong, mm. who's in the cinema right now with uh, his new movie Memoria uh, with mm. Tilda Swinton. Uh, but uh, he he's done a, a movie called Tropical Malady, um, mm. which is a movie in two halves. The first half um, is um, they're in the city in Bangkok, I think, and it's a love story between between a soldier and another man. But then it just suddenly switches to to the second part, and the second part is in the woods, and it is is. And the wood thing, I really wanted to to imitate, but I I didn't really. It's not half as good, but <laughs> it, it was an inspiration. So I would say that movie, uh, but also maybe movies by Ozu in general. Ozu was a Japanese director who who made a lot of movies about very minimalistic movies, slow movies about family and family dramas. So I would say that there's hopefully a, a little bit of resemblance to my novel, which also is a, a little family drama. Yeah. But, but um, if, if, um, if we talk about photography, I, I didn't have any insight into that, but um, I've just started actually to, to photograph. Um, I'm an amateur, I'm really bad, but but I'm hoping to become better, yeah. Um, and I guess there is a way in which, you know, <clears throat> if we're continuing to riff on this theme that your both of your novels, you know, become a certain type of photography of like memory or, or um, scenes that exist um, only in, in the head. Um, and I had wanted to, to talk about when you mentioned um, the, the forest and kind of um, um, there is there is this beautiful I think it's in a couple of different uh, vignettes um, where, um, well, yeah, there's 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 this in multiple vignettes. There is this leopard who shows up, uh, or that shows up in, or or perhaps doesn't show up um, in the Finnish forests. Um, of course, there are no leopards um, in the the Finnish forests, um, but uh, the narrator at one point. Um, um, uh, is kind of second guessing himself. His teacher comes up to him and says, "Like, hey, look at this book. It's a sort of like guidebook for um, like animals that exist in the Finnish landscape." I, I think, um, and uh, and he says, "There are no forests here. There are no monkeys here." Um, and he's like, wait, what did I, could I have told them that, that there are leopards here? I know that there are no leopards in the Finnish forests. Um, and, and there's also this uh, recurring um, theme where he studies extra, extra hard um, in order to, to prevent certain like dream images or reveries um, from, from taking over. Um, and I think, yeah, this, this kind of like, how, how do you, um, how do you construct memory? Um, this this is also obviously a, a theme that um, that comes up in antiquity. It's not least in the the section that Hannah just read for us, um, where the narrator um, concludes ultimately that she is not going to take this photograph um, surreptitiously, um, not out of respect for for Olga, but um, because she doesn't want to ruin the memory. Uh, 
Um, and I think that uh, your novels are both very beautiful meditations on memory, the ways that we chose to, to the, choose to, to narrate or frame um, experience in, in construing the, the stories that explain our lives to ourselves and, and others. Um, so you already started talking a little bit about that, but I'm curious to hear uh, a little bit more about that and how, how kind of um, novels are, are suited to, to doing that. Um, in both of, of your novels, there's also a way that the, the structure of the novels work on this. They're kind of like recursive. They're not, uh, neither of them are fully chronological. Um, they go back a little bit, things shift kind of in time. Um, just throwing a lot of things out there, um, but curious to hear you talk about those, those things. Do you want to start or should I start? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I, when I was writing this, I, I think something definitely uh, clicked maybe when, um, when, when this theme sort of starting to um, crystallize. Uh, this for me relates a little bit to the, the setting of the novel as well. Uh, it takes place in a Greek city called Hermopoli, which uh, was built in the 19th century and like a lot of architecture um, in the West, it's really sort of a pastiche on ancient Greece, which um, intrigued me a lot. Uh, I, I was sort of curious about um, that sort of um, cre creation of narratives uh, as well. Like in the, I guess, uh, in, in both the very large scale, um, like a, a nation, constructing a narrative about itself and um, a family constructing a narrative about um, about itself. Uh, and in this case, it's it's very much about, um, I mean, the, the frame, I've often thought about the, the frame story for antiquity as almost an erotic thriller, basically. There's there's something like a little seedy about the, the premise, but um, the main, the main thing is always uh, the narrator's attempts to um, tell herself a story that she can um, live with, basically, I think. Um, so that was uh, definitely, um, yeah, generative to think about. I, I think uh, our books have that in common that our narrators um, want things to be in a certain way that it may be is not. For example, in your book, Hannah, uh, before she went to Hermopoli, uh, she, she had thought of it as a very ancient old city. Right. Which it's not, but maybe she wants it to be in that way. And, and you can also tell that she wants it in how it's written. Mm. Um, but also she maybe wants her relationship to Helena to be extraordinary mm. and that they have this big thing which they maybe don't have um, and and in my in in my book um, if you would call it a love triangle it would be between the narrator his older brother and his mom and the thing that he wants is to is them to have something in common uh, in common he wants to belong he wants he wants um, he wants to be in the same memories as as them mm -hmm. So I think that's why he's so intrigued by by uh, these photographs that he finds of of the other two that are in the woods because mm. it's from a, a happening that he he knows that it had it has happened and he knows that he wasn't involved but I think that he he in in some way wants it to be a memory that he, he make he wants to make it his own memory and. Mm. Um, he start, he's starting to fantasize about them, uh, although he wasn't there at all. And, and can, I just, maybe can I just just very mm -hmm. quickly situate that? So that's like, um, that's when the rest of his family is out blueberry picking, but he was too young to to come along. This was, this was uh, earlier um, yeah. uh, after their arrival in, in Finland. Um, yeah. Just to give that little context. Yeah, so, but, so I, I don't really know what he does, but he's fantasizing about it and what he does unfolds for the reader. Mm -hmm. um, but on, on the question of how, how memory work in constructing a narrative, I think in, in the chapter that I, I read where 
the narrator sits uh, on the couch with a bunch of photographs in front of him and, and then they all get mixed up and then he, he tries to organize them. Uh, I think that's telling in how you, how you construct the narrative um, uh, when you have all these small bits that don't fit together. So mm -hmm. maybe that's, that's a, a way of making sense of all this to try to organize them according to, to uh, principles. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting that both uh, both these kinds of attempts, um, you know, there's there's a lot of pain underlying both of these stories, um, and I think it's possible to read them as like as as having a lot of that, but it's also possible to read them as something quite. Um, uh, I think, especially in in the case of antiquity, quite beautiful, um, and and perhaps uh, Shade and Breeze uh, is is uh, very kind of like tender and and funny mm -hmm. often, um, and perhaps that's also this kind of uh, the difference in in age of the narrators. <clears throat> so we have um, in in Shade and Breeze a, a preteen um, narrator who's kind of you know looking into this land of adults like seeing it as both something very um, exciting and attractive, but also a little bit scary at times, I think. Um, and in antiquity, um, you know, the, the narrator is, is older, she's a little bit um, blasé, um, jaded, uh, sort of, um, and uh, kind of the third big theme that, um, that I thought we could talk about um, is, is youth. Um, where, uh, just to set that up a little bit as well, where <clears throat> Antiquity's narrator is, is kind of troubled by this improper um, age gap between herself and Olga. Um, and uh, that difference is, is the most uh, evident when they're near um, other teens. Um, mm -hmm. One of my favorite scenes, um, I think if I had to choose one amongst many, um, describes this kind of almost flock of boys who are drifting around uh, the town square. Um, they're looking like they need something to lean on, the handlebars of a bike, a fence outside of a school. Um, and they're at the end of childhood, uh, at the threshold of life, lonely with their impatient boredom. Um, and I think there's both kind of a, a sense of envy um, and a sense of disgust almost um, in the description of, of these flocks of boys, which uh, probably has, has many um, roots. The, the narrator is like so obviously, as we said, uh, past that stage of life. Um, it's also a novel that has almost no straight men in it, um, very few men in, in general, um, and teenage boys perhaps have this very particular uh, relationship to, to that kind of uh, masculinity. Um, and in Shade and, and Breeze, um, the, that, that kind of threshold masculinity is uh, maybe represented by Hugh, um, the older brother, um, and the younger brother narrator kind of is watching that combination of both beauty and the capacity for, for violence as well. Um, there are a couple of incidents of that um, that, that also maybe marks that um, age for, for many boys. Um, and I don't know, it's, it's a, I think seeing like that period of life that is such a focus of so many cultural productions, like it's, it's a time that has so many, much promise and excitement, right? But it's in both of your novels, it's, it's seen from, you know, before um, and then from after, um, which, which is something that's maybe not so, so common um, as a vantage point on that period. Um, I, yeah, and when I was thinking about, about this theme, I wonder if there's like maybe a queer thing there as well um, in, in both of these um, books. Um, again, throwing out these, uh, these, these thoughts, um, if you wanna think about it. Yeah, uh, for me, there definitely is um, a, a queer thing, which I think is, well, first of all, I should say that the, the I, I believe this, the scene that you refer to here, I think was um, the, the very first thing that I ever wrote that then ended up in the novel. Um, and at that stage, I hadn't peopled the novel with anyone, basically. It was just, I was interested in th this image of um, a group of teenage boys hanging out. Um, and I think there's something, there, yeah, there's something fascinating with that image. I think you summed it up really well, but there's so much, um, 
um, anticipation, obviously, when you're a teen, um, and uh, there's an awkwardness um, with teenagers, uh, and I think especially teenage boys, um, that seems to, um, well, you know, there's, you're, yeah, you're on the threshold of, of something you're maybe experiencing your, your first, um, first love or something, um, probably experiencing a lot of shame as well. Um, and I, I feel like this, you could almost tell from, from their posture, uh, oftentimes. And, um, but the, the thing that I was interested in was, um, that I've, I've often thought of, um, the, the the sort of homophobic trope about um, queerness that queer people are almost in a state of arrested development like you're there's something childish about being queer or um, it's I mean something a queer teenager might hear is it's just a face you know um, so that's that's always been interesting to me and in reality I think being queer uh, or being um, aware of your queerness as a teen um, often comes with a loss of innocence, I suppose. Um, like experiences that are very um, uh, com communicated to you like as important part of being a teenager, like um, partying or uh, having um, having a crush is, it could be really devastating. And I think it's devastating for straight people as well in that age. But um, there's there's this drama um, that's, that's added there. Um, so one, one thing about the narrator's gaze um, upon the other teenagers, I think, has to do with the fact that, and this is not explicit in the text, I think, but I imagine that the narrator um, realizes right away, basically, that Olga is queer. I, I feel like she probably picks that up. And um, when, when juxtaposing her to the other teens, they appear um, as rather childish, whereas this allow this realization allows her to view Olga as slightly older. And I think there is, uh, I can't remember which, where it is, but I think towards the end of the novel, she has a realization that these teenagers are probably the same age as, as Olga. Um, and this, this comes almost as a shock to her. Um, they're, they're also sort of, they always appear um, well, they appear rather childish. They're they're like passing soda bottles between each other and um, like fighting. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that's um, that's that's where the, this fascination with youth comes from, I guess. Um, yeah, <laughs> long answer. Yeah, I, my narrator my narrator is also i think fascinated by by teendom but but i don't think that he has a concept of what it is i think for him it's just that he is an, an older human being and and that it it it, it, um, it comes with the freedom he can he can uh, go out at night he can bring girls home he can buy a leather jacket and so on um but uh, your narrator hannah sh she knows what kingdom is and she knows that mm. it's a phase that will pass and my narrator maybe he thinks that when you become old you just you're just old like <laughs> like mm. he was so so there's there's definitely a disgust towards uh he and ma also but I don't think that it has it has something something to do with them being with him being a teenager, mm -hmm. but I, I think that it's just that they don't know what studying is. They don't know what it's like to be good at school. Mm -hmm. uh, and if he sees a team in in Hill, I think it's very idealized. Um, as I said, it comes with a certain greater freedom. He can do whatever he wants. Um, but but when when he gets in trouble, uh, when he gets in trouble, uh, maybe the reader uh, can grasp that it's it's because of his teendom and uh, mm. all the hormones and so on. But for the narrator, it's just because he is an idiot. He's he should he should uh, be able to get his his shit together and behave like a, a normal human being. 
um, so for him it's not it it doesn't have something to do about masculinity or sexual norms uh, uh, etc maybe for the reader I don't really I don't really know because the the ingredients are there but I, I don't really explore those themes that much the ingredients uh, he gets his first job uh, his leather jacket he dresses weirdly he has a dark voice and so on it's a troubled teen boy's life but if if it would be an attempt on commenting on sexual norms and and so on it's not a very good one <laughs> it's a rather half-ass lazy one but it wasn't my intention so <laughs> Yeah, I think for me, for me, for, for me as a reader, I definitely, there is like he, I don't know, maybe it's also just that the narrator is really attuned to or looking for beauty, maybe, because um, I think he sees that in Hugh a lot. Like there is this mm -hmm. really beautiful, just so sweet scene where um, Hugh has his, his, uh, his shirt buttoned in a particular way. <laughs> um, is it all the way up or it's like only the top button? It's like just, the, it's just, yeah. the... Oh, like exactly the top button and so he um and and he he just keeps repeating this he's like wow just the top button just the top button and there's this like uh admiration for for making such a you know wild sartorial choice perhaps uh that that somehow is like very um i love i don't know there, yeah to, to, i i couldn't help but read into that some kind of like uh the like the, the beauty of masculinity or something, but I, I might also just have a, an eye that's like always looking for that in uh, <laughs> in, in novels and in, in cultural um, products. Um, I think we do have a couple of questions from the audience, perhaps. Um, if, if you have more to say about any of these themes, um, I, I don't wanna interrupt us, but we could also switch to, to talk about that if um, Alex wants to jump on and MC that part. Yes. Um, well, thank you so much uh, for that discussion. There were so many um, interesting or yeah, threads that we can kind of unravel for, for ages. But um, yes, we do have a couple of questions that have come through. Um, first one uh, is from Sarah Death. Um, and um, she's discussing, discussing, or in particular, that Hannah um, she sees that you were a, a fellow master's student at Valang with uh, Chana Rida, yes. um, uh, whose work Sarah has translated. Um, and her question is, is actually related to your, um, the creative writing courses that you've done, but actually we mm. can expand that to, yeah, Wynne's Wynn's experience yeah, yeah. as well. Um, she asks, uh, is there a, a Valang then, Biskup's on a kind of stereotype that emerges uh, from those courses, or do you feel that they give you quite free reign to um, develop in your own ways? Um, I do, yeah. I, I, uh, my experience has been that, um, I mean, there's, there's at least, I don't know how, how the landscape is in, in England or the UK and uh, the USA, but in, in Sweden, there's like every five or three years, there's always uh, like a debate about um, writers' schools and, and uh, the literature that comes out of them. But I've, um, my experience has been that um, we, we've been a rather, uh, like in terms of how we write and what we're interested in, we're a rather diverse group and, um, I, so I've I've thought about it uh, a lot if if there's a, a certain style that emerges, but I've never been able to pinpoint what that would be, and not a, maybe not even um, found um, that there's a huge difference between um, people who have gone to Biskupsana or uh, Vardland. I think it's also quite common to go to Biskupsana and Vardland. So there's, um, but yeah, I don't know. Is is there <laughs> is there some rivalry there when? What do you think? No, we're all good friends. <laughs> yeah, we really are. <laughs> Just one happy Yeah, I've, yeah I've, I've thought about this uh, too. Um, it's it's hard to to not do it since uh, there there's also a debate every three or five years, as you said. But um, 
for me, for me, I felt, I felt very, very free, which I think maybe is the most, most important thing when you're at a writing school. And I mean free, as in that I, I actually thought very little about the, the product as a book or um, how am I going to get this published and so on, at, at least in, in the first year. Um, and uh, and the, the texts are, are read on their own premises. And by that, I mean that they people take time to read your texts and mm -hmm. and i think i i've come to realize this after my book was published because um, a, a common reader doesn't doesn't read the same way as you do on the writing school so that's a big difference and and maybe if, if you want to talk about uh writing school pros or something like that may, maybe it has something to do with that um mm -hmm. that uh, uh, the texts maybe are more dense or slow pacey and so on, but I don't I don't think that's a, either a good or a bad thing. It's just a consequence uh, that I've learned after I was uh, published. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and actually, I, I suppose in the terms of the the kind of the writing process and, and writing for a reader, it perhaps links into um, a, another question that we've had that's specifically for you, Hannah, um, in the portrayal or discussion of the portrayal between the relationship between the protagonist and mm. Olga in um, antiquity. Um, uh, and the person asks if um, this is a concern or a consideration for when the book comes out in translation in the US, for example. Um, obviously, when you're writing, you're not kind of writing for a reader, but I wonder if that is something that um, you could comment on the, the sort of considerations afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. I, I have to say I was surprised by um... <clears throat> or maybe I've missed something, but but um, my experience was that it, that it wasn't uh, like the moral um, the moral of the story or the the immorality of the narrator was was not very much discussed in um, uh, when it came out in Sweden. And I think um, I, I I can only speculate, but I think that that's for a, a lot of reasons. I think maybe it has to do with the narrator being a woman, and I think it has to do with um, the, the like insane youth culture um, surrounding teenage girls uh, where like this situation um, maybe doesn't seem so um, strange to some people. I don't know, but um, I haven't really, I haven't given it a lot of thought. Um, and, um, and this is maybe, I don't know if this is, um, my, my impression is that um, people who read uh fiction are in general um aren't uh very easily offended or or even upset um i should say uh so i think um maybe there's that but i'm not sure i i uh yeah we'll see what happens <laughs> do you have you given this any thought kira um a little bit. Um, I think that um, there is a sense, um, you know, the culture wars are unfortunately alive mm. and well in the United States um, and uh, to some extent in the UK as well. Um, I think I share your view that, you know, people who read fiction, like it's it's not a like it's not a book that condones this as some it's it's a very complex book. Right. Um, mm. It's a very like multi layered um troubling book and I think the beauty of it makes it even more like you read it and you're like oh gorgeous 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 and then you're like wait what you know um mm -hmm. and that's a really effective uh kind of interplay um and I think that's like one of the things that literature can do very very well um yeah it's <sighs> to some extent it's you know I think um 
there it, it certainly happens that people read books and they're like oh here's this one thing that I don't like and so therefore like cancel this or whatever but um yeah I think it's hard to I think it's hard to read the book and and read it as some kind of um you know condoning of uh abusive relationships with minors um it's I think the the question of what is consent um is actually quite it's obvious it's a very important question um and I think that's also something that's very well explored in this novel because there is a sense that you know like the narrator is able to to convince herself that Olga wanted this you know Olga is like mm -hmm. flirting with her like is pushing it a little right. bit does that mean that she should have done it you know um so I think if, if anything it's it's a very uh, nimble exploration of these themes that are difficult um yeah thank you um, we have one last question um, from the audience, uh, which is for both of you, um, and it's about well, your progression um, in your next product, uh, project. So from writing this debut, what in writing have you found uh, yourself to enjoy the most? And um, what are you interested or would you like to keep exploring in coming novels or projects that you're working on? Okay, so it's a two-part question. Yeah. <laughs> I'll start with the first part, the funny part. Uh, what I what I enjoy the most, I think, I think that um, after the first couple of months, where I struggled very much about just finding the voice or finding the form for my book, after that, when I I felt that I had found something, I had this wonderful feeling of being completely absorbed absorbed by by uh, what I was doing and uh, I think that it, it had to do with that I, I knew what I could write I knew what fitted and not fitted and I, I could think about things that had to do with the story and the characters I, I didn't have to think about um, I wasn't so neurotic uh, I think, and that that feeling was, uh, was wonderful. When I woke up and went to the store, I just thought about hmm, what will happen next. How how should I phrase this, and so on. So, yeah, that feeling was wonderful. And I hope uh, to answer the second question about the future. I hope to uh, to get to that state again, and I think I can do it. But uh, Right now, it feels a little bit difficult. I'm I'm still struggling to 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 find um, find that thing. I don't know how to explain it, but it, it doesn't have to do with narrative or or plot or something like that. It just has has to do with tone, I think, tone and voice and perspective. And um, I think it, I think, and I hope that it will be. Uh, kind of different from my first book, maybe less, maybe less visual and more, more inner life ish. I don't really know, but I hope so. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, so for me, I uh, I'm writing something right now that is very different from uh, antiquity. Uh, but uh, photography is, um, or actually the, the photographs as objects almost are, are quite um, important to this, this new thing as well. So I think that's something that I still sort of um, carried over from, um, from writing antiquity. Um, but I would actually, lately I've, I've thought a lot about um, that I would love to sort of um, keep exploring the, the same characters that were in antiquity. Uh, like, <laughs> right, it, it feels a bit like writing fan fiction about your own book, but um, yeah, I have, I have some desire to hang out with them a little more. So maybe I'll do that. That's great. Um, and we are nearing the end of our time, but I couldn't let this opportunity well uh, you're all in the same kind of space with, with your translator to ask a question about that, that experience of translating for you, Kira, and of being translated. Kira, you mentioned earlier that it's quite a, a 
collaborative experience or a collaborative work. Um, what are your experiences of that? Um, yeah, of that collaboration or the experience of being translated and of translating. Yes, I'll just jump in to, to say that when I when I say collaborative so far, um, I mostly mean that I just think that any translation is collaborative because it is, you know, two people's words. Um, so far, um, you know, I, we have done a little bit of um, I'm farther along um, with antiquity because that was kind of um, made clear that that would be published in English uh, sooner. Um, but um, I it's it's very wonderful to to actually get to be in touch with your authors um, and to have the chance of of um, discussing things and, and you know asking about nuances um, I think with when we've already uh, like I've asked a couple of times like oh do you mean this or that um, especially when there's this like particular kind of wry um, humor um, that feels important to, to get you know just like surprising kind of turns of, of perspective perhaps uh, that you want to make sure to to get right um, it's it feels like an immense privilege for me to to translate both of these books which are like both on themes that I'm really really interested in they're both like gorgeously written um, it's like the best translation experience for me is like when I just want to clothe myself in the words of the author and that's how I feel with with both of these and I think it's extra fun to translate uh, an author who um, you know, writes from a Finland Swedish perspective because that's where I have my background um, as well. And yeah, um, I, uh, yeah sorry go on. No, yeah, I, I really, um, I, I don't have anything very intelligent to say, but it's, uh, it's strange and it's surreal, but nice uh, <laughs> to be translated. Um, and uh, Kira is such an amazing uh, reader, which um, I, I think is, is really a, a privilege. So uh, yeah, I've, it's just been an insane, um, fabulous experience to read your translations. I can, uh, um, I, I agree on, on that. What did you say? Uh, surreal and nice? No? Strange and nice? Uh, just just a month after my book came out in Swedish, it, it was uh, released in Finnish. So I, I, uh, I don't know. I think for me, for me it, it, the, the big thing is that you can't, you can't, have the same amount of control that you can with your original text, obviously, but it also depends on language. And, and, and Finnish is, it's, uh, it's a completely different language. So you have to, you have to uh, accept that uh, things like rhythm and repetitions and, and so on, but you, you just have to drop it. So I, I think it, it was an interesting experience because I, um, the first time, or, or the the time after I I had uh, sent in the final draft, I felt like, oh, now I can't control it anymore. Maybe maybe I've uh, done something. Uh, maybe there are major flaws in it that I can't fix anymore. But but uh, yeah, it, it's like an. Uh, um, a version of that where you, you're being translated. It's your own work, but it's not really your own work anymore. So it's very interesting. Well, yes, it's been so interesting to hear um, your discussion on your works. Um, and yes, it's been an incredibly wide ranging and layered discussion. And I would love to hear you guys speak for, for so much longer, but I think it's probably time for us to wind up. Um, thank you so much uh, to everyone that's joined for uh, you know, braving braving the wilds of, of Zoom. And um, thank you especially for to our panel for, um, for such fascinating questions and answers to those questions. Um, as Kira mentioned at the start of this conversation, both of these books uh, will be available in English in the near ish future. So um, I hope this conversation has whet your appetite for more 
Um, and I really look forward to, to seeing those books as they come out in English. Um, so yes, thank you very much for joining. Um, and for more from Swedish Book Review, uh, go to our website, uh, swedishbookreview.org. Um, thank you and have a great afternoon or evening. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Truly a pleasure. Thank you.